I want you to think how many times have you been asked to estimate a project and you have no clue what to answer. Even more, you have no clue how to even approach the project at all. My name is Federico Mengas, I'm from Argentina, and I mainly work as a cybersecurity architect and learn through support. As you can see, I have many certifications, technical ones, management ones, I really like to mix things, and I've been playing with checkpoints for the last five years. Since then, I've been involved in so many different projects from many different industries. But I just don't play with checkpoint. I also use F5, anti-Linux technologies, I've been involved in some deployments, so I know my way around in cybersecurity. I really like to participate in checkmates because to give you an idea, in the last all of my most of the knowledge that I gained in the last six months was because of sharing, sharing information with the community. There I can see how to troubleshoot things, I can share my findings, I even did a small white paper about HTTPS inspection. So my advice to you, if you really want to learn your way around checkpoints, just join checkmates. So, to put ourselves in the mood. I know it works. First, let's talk about the customer. The presentation that we are going to see today is based on a customer, which is one of the biggest ISP companies in Argentina, and they are center. They, uh, they mainly provide many different solutions for governmental institutions, but one of their services is MSSP, okay? So, in this project, we are not only affecting the customer, but also the customers of our customers. So, so that's really raises the bar here. And then, one of the things that I really like the most about this customer is that they are a key player in Argentina's cybersecurity strategy. So, they will, they will be expecting really high quality work from you. Now, the project. So my manager approached me and he said, you know, Federico, you have to deploy these two appliances. And so far, so good. I've been doing like the last five years this kind of implementations. But when I wrote the second line of the statement of work, I read I, that I had to migrate 60 virtual systems from ASA to Checkpoint. And many of them have over 4,000 rules, 5,000 rules. So, I was shocked. Then I keep on reading, we had a six months time limit, which is fine, and then to make things even more fun, we have to script the whole migration just in case that we need for Maestro. I think that we are going to deploy it next year, so it was a really fun project to be into. And to be honest with you, I really felt out of my league here, because I have many different deployments, but never something big like this. So, automation. I sit down and start thinking how to live with this because I have to do it. I have no other way. Uh, I can't quit my job right now, so let's do it. I have two ways. The other way implies hiring a bunch of level one guys and going through all the manual work, going through all the configuration, and exporting those rules to checkpoint routes, interfaces, network address translations. You know the deal here. And the second one required me to break a taboo, the taboo of automation. The thing with automation is that if you go it right now, there's a technical complexity around it because there are so many terms and skills that you need in order to do it that you will just leave it there. You need Python, you need Ansible, you need Jenkins, if you have Lambda functions now in AWS, everything, everyone is talking about automation. And there's a human limitation of limiting belief that we, humans, humans, don't trust in the tools of automation. When I started deploying automation, I found that I had a much predictable project. And that's why I asked you the first question at the beginning of this conference. Because it's really hard for us to estimate a project. For example, let's say that you have 10,000 rules. How much time do you need to migrate that? But if you know, but if you don't care about the amount of rules or configurations, then it's really easy to estimate. So I promised you that if you commit to automation using the tools that we will show you, you will be over the moon in how much more productivity you will gain in your process, in your projects. So I told you that the first challenge we have is to translate from the asset configurations to checkpoint. Luckily for me, checkpoint has this amazing tool called SmartBook, which is official, and you can download it right now. 
Just be aware of the limitation because each vendor has its own quirks that you have to move around, but overall it works flawlessly. And the other recommendation that I can give you at first glance, when you put this, this tool and you put the running configuration from the as a firewall, you will have to choose between optimized policy and normal policy. If you can have some bumps in production, I would really recommend optimized policy. Why? Because as you can see, this amazing number, this was the initial rule base that we had, over 60,000. And after, after applying optimized policy in 80% of our firewalls, we reach this amazing number of 60,000 rules, or 90% optimization of the rule base. That means uh, that your firewall work will run smoothly, and the rule base will be so much easier to manage. But the normal policy will assure you that all the policies will be properly memorized. And the optimized one, maybe it misses some rules. We're still investigating because this tool is also open source. So for the moment, if you can avoid some errors, if you can have some errors in production, then go optimize. But always remember to play safe. What I mean with this is that if you know that you have some critical services running in your environment, then just create those rules to support those services. That way, you will not have issues in production, or at least the critical ones. Let's continue. Some more tips. If you are using this tool like me, like I, don't, I use it like 90 times between the test and the production deployments, look for common object names. The API will, from Checkpoint will not create an object with the same name. It will give you an error. And you can tell me, okay, that's not an issue because you can use it again and again and again. again. That's not true. Let's think of a, an outside interface from the, from the one used to connect to the internet. As I always call them, outside interface, all in capital letters, as you can see here. And you, when you use smart mode to migrate this rule base, it will create an object called interface outside, which represents the whole zone, zone of your one link. Thing is that, let's suppose that you may migrate the first virtual system. Everything goes flawlessly, the customer is stuck in hand, and when you may write the other one, everything seems fine. But the truth is that the second rule base will use the same object as the previous one. So you will have an updation probably because the rules will not match those connections. And really don't worry about a bit like this. Uh, because you can have as many as you like, and I also recommend having many or bit like this if you need. Just because if you need to change some modifications, just make them unique for that virtual system. As you can see here, what I did was like putting the Plus dash virtual system one, network dash virtual system two, etc. Always check the error log. That's the most critical advice that I can give you with smart mode because my first migration I didn't check it to be honest with you, and it's the only way that you can see if there were some errors because after you export this policy to smart mode, you will have an HTML file with all the rule base, which is really nice, but the error log will tell you which is what is missing. So go ahead, spend some time, and read the error log. And, and to finish, it's more more part, if possible, script it. So I can do this replacement process by hand. It should, be, take me, should take like two minutes, but this script can be made from almost any level one IT guy or girl. I mean, even if you are not from IT, just look, um, how can I replace things in Linux? And it's really, really easy to use. This is just a part of the script, right? But what I did here is just replace, okay, some, for example, network with network dash file VS1, for example. So this is when I start believing in automation. I mean, you don't have to put your laboratory engineer in this implementation. You can use more inexperienced resources just to do this work. So remember to always think in percentages when you automate. So far we have the rule base. The customer is happy because he is seeing progress in the project, but we needed a way to automate the interfaces and routes to VSX. If you ever play with VSX, you know that it's a really daunting process uh, to create interface and routes because, because you have to go click by click in the smart dashboard. And let's say if you have like 10 or 20 interfaces and 10 routes, you can do it in like 15 minutes. But if you have a project like mine, where you have like 100 interfaces and 300 routes, then it will take you some time. And I'm really excited about this tool because it's a tool that we developed for this project. 
It's open source. You can download it right now from Checkmates and also GitHub, and it's properly documented there. So, how it works? First, we have the same file, which is a running configuration that we use in the smart mode. Then we use this simple PowerShell command just to input the file, and then the tool will generate three different files. Right? These are these are just examples. The first one that you will probably use most is the translation to the VSX language. What it does, it will translate to VSX provisioning to language, and you will have all the interfaces and routes. We are only seeing static routes, okay, just to verify it. And what you have to do is just put this on your management server, run this grid with this command, and it will create your entire virtual system. That's really great. And then, your automation engineers will love this, it also creates two JSON files containing all the interfaces and routes. So, we mainly created this because we wanted to automate the zone assignation within Checkpoint. Thing is that we can't do it via AP, Checkpoint API right now. But, for example, if you are using ACI, Ansel, or other arbitration for automation tools, you can input these files and create a really amazing firewall or router or any host you want. It's really nice to automate things. So, so far we have 70% of the whole VS creation process automated. Only thing left is to check the rule base that we have to do it manually. And then we have to create, to assign the zones to the different interfaces. After that we have to deploy. There's no way to automate deployment. I mean, we can do it, but we have to be there to see if it's working. So we just deploy it, change the VMs, and see if it works. That leads me to some key lessons that I learned from this project, and if you have a similar one, they will really kickstart and make things really much easier for you. So first, the technical ones. We noted that there was a lack of understanding in the end customer. Not my customer, but the customer of my customers. Many times we asked them what is running on your firewall, and they, they told us, you tell me. So imagine yourself if I say to you, you have to deploy this firewall, uh, but I have no clue what, it, what I want to do, just make it work. It's a really awkward situation. So in order to avoid this and mitigate the risk, we made some simple, simple free and post checks. There are three of them and are really easy to remember. First, amount of connection prior migration. Then amount of translations being done prior migration, and then <coughs> I, I think that like ah, amount of throughput prior migration. After we pass it to checkpoint, we start seeing logs coming, but logs are really not a measure if it's working fine or not. But if you check these three parameters that I gave you, you will have like a certain feeling of certainty that things are working fine. I mean, if you have, for example, 100 connections, and after you migrate, you have two then there's an issue. So that's for you to check. Because many times the customer wasn't even during the conversation, the, the, during the deployment. Then we have a really controversial topic. Most customers don't know that IPS can do almost nothing with encrypted traffic. Nevertheless, they activate the VF4 protection and they think that they are protected. But it's nothing going on. Most of the attacks are in the payload and if it's encrypted, then IPS can do nothing. So in this particular project, we needed to fit 60 virtual systems, highly demanding virtual systems, in two boxes. So we took the decision, after assessing the risk, to bypass from the IPS policy all the HTTPS traffic. That way, there are some, that way we prioritize performance or security in this particular case. And the most critical advice that I can give you if you're playing with VSX, you know that there's a max number of virtual systems per box. But few people know that there's also a max number of interfaces per virtual system. I think that it's 64 by default. And most of the time, you will not have a virtual system with more than 64 interfaces. But in my case, I have this one with 132 interfaces. There's this super node that explain how to overcome this, but there's a trick. A quick trick that if you perform these configurations, your maximum number of virtual system will be cut by half. So if I needed to make this modification, 
I wouldn't have, I would only have only 30 virtual systems to deploy. So you can imagine yourself, if you don't write it prior to starting the project, the customer will be very angry. Luckily for us, I knew this from a lot of customers, so at the beginning of the project, I, I, I tell the customer about this, and we couldn't find a way around. The way around was to split that virtual system in two or three, I, I don't remember. Then the soft skills, often forgotten. For this particular project, they were critical for success. I told you that the end customer didn't have understanding of what was going on in their deployments. That's why we had to apply a team mindset. I mean, we had to meet the customer even if he didn't want to participate. And how can we do that? Then we have to document our, of our technical decisions as a high level decisions and really low level speaking technically, and share with them those decisions and so they can understand what's going on. And then create a predictor and repeatable process. Because even though that you have we have automated the 70% of the project, reality is that if the customer is opposed to it, then your whole automation strategy is broken. So you have to include these soft skills, oh sorry, spoiler, these soft skills in your project management you want to succeed. You have been spoiled, and I, don't like, I know that you like numbers, and I will show with you how much time we gain using these two simple tools, and that's more script that I show you. Using asa 2 esx parser, which is the second tool that I show you, we managed to deploy any virtual system with any amount of interfaces and routes in four minutes maximum. Then, using SmartMove, we managed to deploy rule bases with 4,000 rules between five, between 5 and 15 minutes, really, really time. These two things are automated and can run in parallel. So it's less time. And then, this is quite a manual work. We have to sanitize all the policy just to make sure that it's working. And finally, one and a half minute to push the policy, 80, 80 30. That leads us to an amazing 33 minutes for virtual systems. I don't care about the rules, how many rules you have, how many interfaces. I just create virtual systems, and whenever you like to deploy them, they are ready for you to use. If you're planning to do this manually, I didn't do this myself, just to clarify, it's a calculation, then it will take you in the big system like 27 hours of work. Manual, really daunting work that doesn't provide any value. And remember that we talk about percentages. Do you know how much this represent? 98% less time. 98% more time for you to give value to the customer, for you to study things that matter, and to do anything that you want. So whenever you can, just try automation. That's the best advice that I can give it to you. So what about now? So far we have talked about simple automation. I mean, after you use, you can use this tool right now. You don't have to study anything. But let's go to the next level. So after applying these tools, we managed to almost finish the project in four months. We have two months left of hours. When I was working with the customer, I noticed that they have this amazing tool that promises that will automate all your security operations. And this tool is called SWAR. I don't know if anything, anyone has even worked with one or has read all this, but I will show it to you how it works. Let's imagine together a fictional company. You have infinite budget, and you have, you, are, you have presence in many different countries, so your infrastructure is really, really, really big. Of course, you have checkpoint firewalls, I mean. Um, but let's say that some rogue administrators, like other vendors, so you have a mix, a mix of vendor firewalls. And then you have your domain controllers spread all over the, the globe, your vulnerability scanners, your web proxies and anything, any technology that you like. Funny things or thing is that no, almost nobody does anything with them. I mean, there's so much information for you to see that you have alert fatigue, log fatigue, so your salt operators probably will be just splashing around the scene. So where does SOAR come to play? At first glance, your scene will talk directly through your SOAR. And now let's suppose that your checkpoint finds an attack. I don't know, a phishing website. It's an example that we're going to see now. Then this is where the magic happens. 
if you have properly deployed your, your, deployed your SOAR, then your SOAR will take automatic actions with all the assets in your company via API connections. So you are st start starting to see the value here, right? Let's see a couple of examples just to show you how powerful this is. First, we have the phishing example. Let's suppose that in our fictional company, we have this marketing user that stumbles upon a phishing website. Of course, some of the phishing catches it, and then it reports that log, that event, to the management server. The management server will send this, the, that log to the SIM using log exporter, and then the SIM will send the alert to the SOAR. And after that, the SOAR will apply policies to any assets in your company blocking that IP and that website. Second example, we talk about the importance of IPS in your company. Let's suppose that in parallel of this process, of this attack, some of your administrators are running a vulnerability scanner. You can upload the, those results to your SIM, your SIM can send information to the SOAR, and your SOAR, using the API from Checkpoint, can create a custom IPS policy and push it to your firewalls, just to block those, those particular servers. I mean, sorry, to protect those particular servers. So it's a really, really, really nice tool. And just to summarize this up, after my investigation, um, after I have been playing with this like a lot of time, I found that it's the SecOps tools of excellence. I mean, I don't think that there's another SecOps tool that it's really SecOps. There are only IOCs that you can get from your web or something like that, but this tool really provides value to your company. As you can see, as I told you, there's a multi-vendor integration going on. So the best quality of your, if you're looking for a SWAR, is to look on how many vendors do you have integration. And then it has automatic actions. If you zoom the three, for me, it's the only cybersecurity tool that provides positive return on investment out of the box. Let's be honest, if you buy a check on firewall, of course, that will be easy to manage, but your return on investment will be because your administrator will have more time because it's easier to manage. But when you buy security, because when you buy security, you are preventing loss. It's not an ERP that is pinning up your processes so you can buy more or sell more. Of course, your incident response time will get a lot better. Just imagine how much time it takes to propagate goals in all those in all of our imaginary company. And it leverages your security as a whole. As we can see, by using checkpoint technologies, we can leverage that technology and apply policies to all of our rule base, to all of our assets. Sorry. And of course, it has its problems. First of all, it's so hard to deploy. I will be honest with you. First, we saw simple automation. And then, this is a real deal if you want to enter into security automation. You need vital skills, you need people that know your way around APIs, and it's or a really, really hard. It's a really dependent tool. I mean, it depends. If you, if you want to make it work correctly, then you have to have your scene working right. I mean, you can have alerts because of anything. And then you depend on other vendor integrations. Let's say that vendor X has an offer API, then you will be like, it will be like quite hard to, to do it. And finally, you really need a high level of cybersecurity maturity in your company because you will not get value for him if you don't do that. So, um, we have reached the end of the presentation. First of all, some special thanks, Lucas and Alejandro, for being such an amazing sales engineers. Team, Calspars and Michael, for creating such amazing content in Checkmates. And of course, the customer and the CPX staff for the giving opportunity. Thank you so much, and if you have any questions, you can do that now. Yeah. 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 Yeah.